Hello everybody, um, this is going to be a walkthrough video for the paper 2 reading section questions 1 to 4 uh, of the GCSE English language exam with AQA looking at the Glastonbury and Greenwich Fair um, paper which is now some years old so you might have already looked at this in class um, so I'm just going to be using this paper to go through in one go the four um, reading questions. So just a reminder then of what those four questions are, including the writing section. So we're quite lucky in English because these questions always remain the same. We just don't know obviously what the extract will be, uh, what the extracts will be. Uh, number one, we're going to be looking at choose, choosing four true statements. Number two, the summary question. Number three, the language question. And in this video, we'll finish by looking at number four, which is the comparing of the writer's viewpoints and perspectives question. I'm not going to be looking at question five, um, but you should know by now that question five, the paper will finish uh, with you being asked to write uh, a letter, a speech or an article. But for 2022, we know that it will be an article because the exam board told us back in February. So that is the overview of paper two, five questions. Um, and the total mark of this paper is 80. So in order to uh, complete questions one to four, we obviously need to read the extracts first. And you can fast forward this if you're already familiar with these extracts. But for the purposes of those people that haven't seen this paper before, I'm going to I'm going to read through both of these articles in one go. And then we'll obviously use these in our um, in our responses and our discussions for questions one to four. So source A is the 21st century nonfiction about Glastonbury Festival written by Elizabeth Day. She begins with a headline, Are We Having Fun Yet? And she refers to a man called Anton, who she has seen attending the same year as her. This was 2005. So Anton is standing knee deep in tea coloured water. He is covered in a slippery layer of dark brown mud, like a gleaming otter emerging from a riverbed. The occasional empty bottle of Somerset cider wafts past his legs, carried away by the current. I mean, he says, with a broad smile and a strange staring look in his dilated eyes, where else but Glastonbury would you find all this? He sweeps his arm in a grandiose arc, compassing a scene of near total devastation. In one field, a series of tents has lost its moorings in a recent thunderstorm and is floating down the hillside. The tents are being chased by a group of shivering half-naked people who look like the survivors of a terrible natural disaster. When I was told that the Sunday Telegraph was sending me to experience Glastonbury for the first time, my initial reaction was one of undiluted horror. Still, I thought, at least the weather was good. England was in the grip of a heatwave. But then the rains came. Six hours of an un uninterrupted thunderstorm in the early hours of Friday morning. When I arrived later that day, there was a polite drizzle. By yesterday, the rain had given way to an overcast sky, the colour of exhaled cigarette smoke. The mud, however, remained. And the only way to get around the 900 acre site was, like Anton, to resign oneself to getting very dirty indeed. Everything else might have been damp, but the crowd remained impressively good humoured throughout. It's a very safe, family friendly atmosphere, says Ed Thor, a music student from London. This is my sixth time at Glastonbury and I've never had any trouble. Indeed, on my train to Castle Carey, the carriages were crammed with well-spoken degree students sipping pims and making polite chit chat. The acts of 2005 included Coldplay, Alvis Costello and the American rock band The Killers, who brought a touch of salubriousness to the proceedings by performing in tuxedo jackets and glitter. But Glastonbury has still managed to preserve a healthy degree of wackiness. In the Las Vegas area, a 1950s style diner comes complete with fancy dress rock and roll dancers and a constant stream of Alvis songs. The Chapel of Love and Loathing has a disc jockey booth disguised as a church organ. Apparently couples can get married here. Outside, a man wearing a huge pink afro wig is twirling round and round in bare feet. What happened to your shoes, I ask? They got washed away with my tent, he says cheerily. Bizarrely, everyone seems to be having a brilliant time and there are broad grins wherever I look. In fact, it's almost nice, this Glastonbury thing. And you've got the glossary there. Source B by Charles Dickens is about a Greenwich fair uh, from the 19th century. The road to Greenwich during the whole of Easter Monday is in a state of perpetual bustle and noise. Cabs, hackney coaches, shay carts, coal wagons, stages, omnibuses, donkey chases, all crammed with people, roll along at their utmost speed. 
The dust flies in clouds, ginger beer courts go off in volleys, the balcony of every public house is crowded with people smoking and drinking. Half the private houses are turned into tea shops, fiddles are in great request. Every little fruit shop displays its stall of gilt gingerbread and penny toys. Horses won't go on and wheels will come off. Ladies scream with fright at every fresh concussion and servants who have got a holiday for the day make the most of their time. Everybody is anxious to get on and be at the fair or in the park as soon as possible. The chief place of resort in the daytime after the public houses is the park, in which the principal amusement is to drag young ladies up a steep hill which leads to the observatory and then drag them down again at the very top of their speed, greatly to the derangement of their curls and bonnet caps, and much to the edification of onlookers on from below. Kissing the ring and threading my grandmother's needle, too, are sports which receive their full share of patronage. Five minutes walking brings you to the fair itself, a scene calculated to awaken very different feelings. The entrance is occupied on either side by the vendors of gingerbread and toys. The stores are gaily lighted up, the most attractive goods profusely disposed, and unbonneted young ladies induce you to purchase half a pound of the real spice nuts, of which the majority of the regular fairgoers carry a pound or two at present supply, tied up in a cotton pocket handkerchief. Occasionally you will pass a deal table on which are exposed pennyworths of pickled salmon, fennel included, in little white saucers, oysters with shelves as large as cheese plates, and several specimens of species of snail floating in a somewhat bilious looking green liquid. Imagine yourself in an extremely dense crowd which swings you to and fro and in and out and every way but the right one. Add to this the screams of women, the shouts of boys, the clanging of gongs, the firing of pistols, the ringing of bells, the bellowings of speaking trumpets, the squeaking of penny dittos, the noise of a dozen bands with three drums in each, all playing at different tunes at the same time, the hallooing of showmen, and an occasional roar from wild beast shows, and you are in the very centre and heart of the fair. This immense booth, with the large stage in front, so brightly illuminated with lamps and pots of burning fat, is Richardson's, where you can have a melodrama, with three murders and a ghost, a pantomime, a comic song, an overture, and some incidental music, all done in five and twenty minutes. Just to going to begin, pray come forward, come forward, exclaims the man in the countryman's dress for the seventieth time, and people force their way up the steps in crowds. The band suddenly strikes up and the leading tragic actress, and the gentleman who enacts the swell in the pantomime, foot it to perfection. All in to begin, shouts the manager, when no more people can be induced to come forward, and away rush the leading members of the company to do the first piece. OK, so those are your two extracts. And here is the glossary for source B. Quite a few. Um, again, when you're reading these extracts, the exam board suggests 15 minutes to read both. You don't have to understand every single word in order to get the gist of the extract and still do well. So if there's a word in there like salubriousness or bilious that you're not quite sure of, either ignore it or have a guess what you think it means in the context of the sentence. OK, but you don't need to know every single word. OK, question one then, source A only, lines 1 to 14. You might want to go back and obviously look at that extract. And question one asks you to choose four true statements from a selection of eight. Uh, there will be a little circle at the end of each of these statements in the exam booklet for you to colour in. And you need to choose four true statements. This is four marks and therefore you should spend really four to five minutes. Some of you might get this done very quickly. Uh, which means you've got some extra time to spend on some other questions. So if you're having a go at this, pause the video now uh, and uh, have a go at, at uh, writing down four letters that you think are the four true statements. If not, I will give you the answers in a second. And here we have the answers in red, A, C, F and G. Okay, So those are the four true statements. Moving on to question two, write a summary of the different Things to see and do at Glastonbury and the Greenwich Fair. To speed things up, I've already populated this table with three points in each, with some um, key sites that you can see at each festival or fair. Glastonbury, you can see we have music from well-known bands, uh, couples can get married there, and also people dress up in some wacky clothes. Whereas in, Green in Greenwich, um, the music, there is music, but it's much more traditional music from, from kind of big bands. Um, there are traditional games and you can also watch a show there. Because this is question two, we need to support our summary with reference to the text by highlighting evidence. So here you can see that for each of those points, I have written down some of the key, um, key uh, evidence, a key quote. 
that suggest that my point is actually true and I need to incorporate these quotes within my response. So because this is a summary, this is a comparison, we need to make sure we're talking about both extracts. And it might be that all of our answers for this are just located in one paragraph of the extract. It, it might not be answers consistently running through the whole extract. The, the answers might just be in a paragraph. So look carefully. In order to show you um, what this looks like, I've given you here a couple of examples. We've got a simple example on the left and a more um, confident example on the right. Source A is about the modern Glastonbury Festival and Source B is about an old affair in London called the Greenwich Fair. Glastonbury is full of mud and people, so go camping. Uh, but in Source B, there is music and traditional games played. That will get you some marks, but it won't get you a lot of marks. Uh, it all depends, obviously, on what your predicted grade is. But if you wanted to get a grade four or above, then you need to push that a little bit further, develop it a little bit more with some more detailed inferences, as well as examples and, and evidence from the text. So if you're going to develop it into a more of a full response, you might be looking at the example on the right hand side. Both the Glastonbury Festival and Greenwich Fair are different in terms of what you can see and do. Glastonbury is mainly about the music and celebrity performers such as Coldplay, Elvis and Costello and the Killers, suggesting that the main reason why tickets are sold is because people want to see mainstream popular bands and big names in music. It is a huge outdoor music concert. Away from the music, couples can get also get married, suggesting that they love Glastonbury enough to make it part of their special day and their celebrations. Some festival goers also put great effort into their costumes, wearing afros and fancy dress, implying that the festival has a party atmosphere where people can, can let their hair down and have fun. However, the Greenwich Fair has much more traditional music from a dozen bands, but these bands are not celebrity performers playing popular music. The fair could be seen as more disorganised and chaotic because of all the music playing at once. People also play traditional games such as Kissing the Ring, suggesting that the day is about old-fashioned sports as a way to seek entertainment. Unlike Glastonbury, people, are, people also watch plays such as a melodrama, inferring that, they are, that there is a greater variety of entertainment on offer in Source B. So the quotes there are precise and short, the inference is developed, and you've also got a clear comparison, for example, through the, through the word both and also halfway down through the word however. So a summary, remember, is your explanation. You're explaining why two things are different or similar. Uh, that's what you're doing with this question. So that's question two. Moving on to question three, the language analysis question. This is using source uh, B um, only lines 19 to the end. To shorten it even further, I've gone up to line 28 to the end, actually. Um, so I've, I've just made it a little bit um, smaller. Uh, how does Dickens use language to describe, or sorry, how does Dickens use language to make you feel part of the fair? In other words, what that's asking you is how is the fair described and how does the writer make you feel part of it through um, the kind of things that he describes. So you can pause the video now, looking at this extract and writing down perhaps some words, phrases and techniques that makes you feel part of the fair. In other words, how is the fair portrayed? And if not, I will give you some possibilities in the next slide. So here we have some uh, possibilities, uh, techniques in the middle and some evidence in the left hand column there. Um, that second quote is perhaps too long. I would want to shorten that, but I did want to just show you the whole of the quote to give you the idea of the list coming through. Um, onomatopoeia is there. You know, you can almost hear the sound of the of the fair through some of these um, words. Uh, we've got direct address at the bottom, verbs and adverbs as well. The most important part of the table is the is the part of the right hand side which is making sure that you answer the question and don't go off on a tangent. So the examiner is asking us specifically about how the fair is presented and how in turn that makes us feel that we're there with Dickens because of the because of the noise, because of the senses. So before you would write this question, you would need to think about, well, what does these words mean? What does that tell you specifically about the fair? Why, for example, has the writer used um, a declarative. Why has the writer used these verbs like swinging? Uh, why has the writer used onomatopoeia in a list? What is that doing in the depiction of the fair? To show you some examples, again, uh, a simple uh, version on the left and a more convincing 
confident answer on the right. The writer describes the fair as being very busy, swings to and fro. This means the fair is very busy. The writer also uses direct address, imagine yourself, meaning they are talking us, to us, which makes the text memorable and makes us want to read on. Again, relatively simple. They have quoted, but it, they haven't really developed the quotes. They just kind of, you know, slapped in there. Um, some devices, but not very developed. And you've got those good old kind of meaningless comments in English memorable, makes us want to read on. Your English teacher perhaps is allergic to those phrases uh, because they don't actually give any effect at all. And, you know, you always ask yourself, really, you're going to remember this, are you, next week? Uh, you really want to read on, do you? So again, they're not really that genuine either, those kind of comments. Um, if you're going to push it even further or into the more top of the mark scheme, you might want to write something like this to get a higher grade. Dickens presents the fair as chaotic, disorientating and extremely crowded. Remember, I've said in a previous video that your first sentence for language analysis should be answering the question straight away. And that's already giving you some marks for interpretation. One of the ways this is achieved is through the use of verbs, swings you to and fro and in and out, which reinforces that the fair is so busy that Dickens cannot walk where he wants to go and is instead having to battle and jostle with other people because of how busy the streets are. He feels like he is stuck in a current and is being pushed backwards and forwards as if he was on a swing. The sound of the fair are also conveyed through a list of onomatopoeic words such as ringing, bellowing, clanking, squeaking, which help readers understand the deafening sounds of the fair at the fair, creating a disorientating experience where your senses are overpowered by so much to see and hear. This is also reinforced with the clarity of the noise of a dozen bands with three drums in each, all playing different tunes at the same time, implying that there is no musical harmony because different music is playing all at the same time. A list of verbs, screams of women, shouts of boys, penny dittos, emphasises the chaos and busyness of the fair, suggesting it is full of energy and movement, so much so that the writer is struggling to take it all in. Finally, the direct address, Imagine Yourself, suggests that Dickens is speaking directly to the reader, allowing us to understand vividly the sights and sounds of the fair, which makes us feel part of it. So we link it back to the question there at the end. So that was more developed, it's more confident, you've got techniques, quotes, as well as some more detailed comments on effects there. Okay, and so with language, remember to always start by answering the question straight away and then linking your evidence after that to that uh, presentation that you've, that you've stated in the first sentence. Finally, question four, perhaps the trickiest of the questions, compare how the writers convey their different views and experiences of the festival and fair they describe. Um, again, if you've looked at previous videos where I look at comparing writers' viewpoints, I follow this cycle. And uh, speeding up for this one, I'm going to follow that same cycle but this is about gathering all the information that you need in order to be in a good position to write this response. All of these components need to be in your answer in order for you to do well with this question. So 16 marks, approximately 20 minutes. Like I said, to speed things up, I'm just going to show you what to do. So the first thing you need to do is you need to look at both extracts and find a couple of quotes from each, which I've highlighted here in yellow. You then need to go and look at what uh, methods are in those quotes, which I've done here in green. We've got the adjective undiluted, the adverb bizarrely, the adjective anxious, the verb swings to and fro, in and out. So I'm also looking at the methods. The next thing I need to label the writer's attitudes in pink here. So what are their attitudes? How would I describe their attitudes? And essentially, this is what you're comparing. Sometimes students forget that this is not about the festivals themselves, but about the writers who visit them. So you're interested here in Elizabeth Day and Charles Dickens because you're comparing the pink words and how they perceive uh, the fair or the festival they go to. And finally, what you need to do is you need to expand on why you think they have those views, which I've done here in uh, blue. So you need to be able to give it insight into why they have the views that they do. Um, a tip for question four is to put yourself in the shoes of the writers and chances are you might feel the same as they do uh, in their situation. So put yourself in the shoes of the writer. That might give you some insight into why they have the perspectives that they do. Once you've gathered this information, you're in a position to then have a go at writing the response. And finally, for this video, again, I'm going to show you a simple answer and a more detailed answer. So the simple one on the left, the writer of source 
of Source A, um, Day, hated Glastonbury, horror, but later she really liked it, nice. In Source B, the writer dislikes the fair because it's so busy and cramped. He wants to leave as soon as possible because he is tired of all the noise and people. So that's an example of a more simple response. They are comparing. They have got, you know, questionable use of evidence, but there is evidence in there. There's no methods, really. Um, if you're going to push it even further, then you're looking to achieve something on the right. Both writers convey their perspectives about the festivals and fairs they attend. In Source A, A is initially horrified and judgmental about Glastonbury, which is conveyed through the adjective undiluted, used to describe how she was filled with horror and dread about attending the festival for the first time. Rather than choosing to go, she was sent there to write an article by her employer, suggesting she may have been reluctant to go because she had been she had seen how muddy and chaotic Glastonbury looked in previous years and thought it must be a terrible experience. However, even to her own surprise, once she had experienced Glastonbury, she uses the adverb bizarrely and the adjective nice to present a different attitude. She now feels surprised and complimentary about the festival now that she has actually visited. Talking to polite degree students sipping pims may have made her think may may have made her rethink her opinion of the festival. It was more civilised than she initially thought. In source B, Dickens is initially apprehensive and intimidated by the fair because of the chaos on the roads, which, with everyone eager to see the fair, himself included. He states everybody is anxious to be at the fair as soon as possible, including himself, suggesting he is also rushing to get there, which means the fair must offer some kind of pleasurable entertainment, else he wouldn't go. But once he is at, in the heart of the fair, he develops an overwhelmed and powerless attitude about the fair because of the sheer number of people. He states that he is being that he is being swung to and fro, implying he is cramped and disorientated by everything going on around him. At the same time as being overwhelmed, he may also feel that this is part of the fair's charm. Yes, it's busy, but it's worth it for a fair that only comes once a year. So in other words, he's willing to put up with the chaos because the fair will be gone tomorrow, maybe. Okay. So that is comparing viewpoints of the writers, a simple answer on the left and a more detailed and developed one on the right, using methods there, quoting some words to describe their attitudes, but also going into detail about why they might have the views that they do. We can't just say, oh, well, the writer of say feels horrified because the examiner will, will be wondering why. So we have to be able to infer some meanings um, about you know why they have the views that they do. What, what have they seen? What have they experienced? Which is giving them the perspectives that they have and which they're writing about. OK, so that is a, um, a I suppose, a, a tour, a walkthrough of paper two, the reading section, uh, questions one to four, using the Glastonbury and Greenwich Fair articles.